Thank you very much, everyone, for coming uh, to today's session of Revolutionizing Healthcare. This is the second session in our doubleheader about Autoprognosis 2.0. It's a new tool uh, we released into the world um, for our last session, and which you can find on the dedicated website if you look for autoprognosis.vanishalab.com. So do you have a, have a look uh, there? Um, but I'm sure a lot of you have a nice insight uh, over the past weeks in, into this nice new program. Um, brought your questions here, we hope, so we can talk with you about this. We will have a short introduction and a demonstration of the new tool uh, by Tom Callender. And then Michaela will tell you about how to use autoprognosis in a cardiovascular setting. And uh, Ern will bring in some brief comments about autoprognosis. And then we will go into our roundtable discussion with our guests of today. And afterwards, we have a very extensive Q&A. And hopefully, we'll wrap up around 5 p.m. Our participants today are, uh, as I said, Professor Ern McKinney, who has been here for the last time as well. He's a university lecturer in renal medicine at the University of Cambridge and part of the faculty of the uh, Cambridge Center for Eye and Medicine. We have Dr. Thomas Callender, um, who is a Wellcome Trust Clinical Training Fellow in Respiratory Medicine at UCL. He has been using the tool autoprognosis uh, already, and he is demonstrating about it and tell you about his experience. And we have, as our guests for the roundtable, Dr. Anthony Felipakis, who is the Chief Data Officer of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, founding director of the Data Science Platform, former cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the co-director of the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center. Uh, welcome, Anthony, thank you for coming. And we have Dr. Sarah Blake, who is a cardiology registrar at Geis and St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust and AI Fellow at the AI Center for Value-Based Healthcare and Women in Cardiology representative at the British Junior Cardiologist Association. Welcome to UT. Looking forward to hear from UT during our roundtable. And now um, I hand over to Tom, who will talk about autoprognosis and give a short demonstration of it. Thank you, Tom. Also, if anyone has questions during the talk for the Q&A already, just put it down in the chat and we will read it out or call you up during the Q&A. Thank you. Right, so it's a pleasure to um, be here to talk to you today. I'm, uh, as introduced, Tom Callender. I'm a public health registrar and uh, clinical academic at UCL. And so I thought I'd use this opportunity to really talk to, talk to you about thinking clinically uh, about risk prediction and how autoprognosis can help us in that. And to frame it, I wanted to think about five main questions that I think should be asked before, during and after we develop any major clinical risk prediction model. The first being obviously what is the problem? And I mean that in two broad senses. Often clinical risk prediction tools are built, they can have large numbers of variables, but the real point in a clinical setting is what is the problem you're trying to solve? Can it be solved with a risk prediction model? Will the risk prediction model add enough to make any benefit? And then fundamentally, are there alternatives already out there that you could repurpose? So do you really need to be doing whatever you're trying to do? The next bit is who will be using the risk prediction model? And I often don't think this has been thought through enough before somebody starts. And this could be a multitude of different people. It could be that it's going to be for patients themselves through some sort of platform that you want information in advance. And this could be for a national screening program. It could be that it's going to be a clinician sat with a patient in a consultation room or an allied healthcare professional. And all of this means that you need to think about different types of variables and how it is actually useful. When are they going to use it? So is this going to be, as I said, by somebody's um, bedside in a consultation room? This changes the amount of time you have. And so the number of variables, again, that you can use and the complexity that you can have within it. Why are they going to use it? Is it because it's much, much better than anything that already exists? Because there's almost always an alternative. Uh, is it because it's much simpler? Do you have all of the other things, for example, uh, in, the UK, in the UK, there'll be UKCE marking. That's important. And where or how are they going to use the model? So what kind of interface are you planning on building? Who's going to maintain that interface? And who's going to monitor how the model performs or whether it's degrading over time? And I think that autoprognosis can help us with many of these particular tasks. 
So I'm going to give you an example from lung cancer that I've been working on with Mahela and her group. Um, and so to start us off with the problem in this context, lung cancer survival is desperately poor. And this must be one of the most depressing graphs in medicine. But really, over the last 40 years in the UK, five-year net age standardized survival from lung cancer has barely budged at all. And the reason behind this is because almost all cancers are picked up at a late stage, nearly 60 or 70 percent in the UK. This is 2019 data are diagnosed at stage three or four. And this is because of the fact that lung cancer is quite a non-specific illness. You get coughs and various other things for quite a long time before you know that you have cancer. But the good thing is that screening amongst those who are high risk could reduce lung cancer deaths by about 20% amongst those who are screened. But then the key question here is how do we detect or how do we determine who's at high enough risk to benefit from lung cancer screening? And so in our case, thinking about it clinically, well, why do we need a new risk model? And the main reason is that in the UK, we are nationally going to to roll out a screening program and will make us one of the first countries in the world to think about a risk-based approach because the existing, uh, the US is one of the only countries that actually has lung cancer screening and it uses risk factors. And part of the reason it uses risk factors is because of the simplicity of that. So that kind of comes back to my, my point of how much benefit do you get from risk model versus risk factors? But in the UK, all of our pilots require two risk models to be run and that's 19 variables that have to be collected on each individual. And this is highly resource intensive. In fact, most of these variables are not available in electronic health records, which means that we have to actually phone all of these people up. And to phone them up takes five to 10 minutes on average in the pilots that I'm involved in in North London. And so if you just tot up those numbers, five to 10 minutes per person to, to just do risk eligibility for a million people would mean you'd have to have 87 people sat in a call center working nine to five all day, every day for an entire year just for 1 million people. And there are 7 million current smokers, let alone all of the former smokers who may also be eligible. And this then becomes important at another scale, because if you think about lung cancer, well, the other major condition for which there is already preventative efforts is in cardiovascular medicine. And here in the UK, for example, we use something called the Q-risk score, and that has over 22 variables. So similarly, very resource intensive. So the more that we move to personalized medicine, the more complex this all becomes. But the other reasons are, most countries use country specific data. This reduces generalizability. For example, ethnicity is categorized differently in almost all countries. And most countries considering lung cancer screening don't have the data sets needed to build their own risk models. So the existing ones, which are almost all built in the US may or may not be appropriate. So this is why we thought, right, let's see if we can do something different. And then it kind of came back to who's going to use it and when will they use it. So the difference between us and the US is that our model will be a national screening model done centrally rather than at a patient's bedside. And this changes how we can, how many variables we can legitimately use. In our case, who's going to use it? Ideally, I'd like something that patients could use that in the same way that they could fill in their COVID tests online, it was simple enough that a few online questions were enough for me to get some of those variables. But if not, it's going to be allied healthcare professionals and perhaps GPs because doing this at a central level is quite complex. And when are they going to use the model? Again, this is all going to be done ideally behind the scenes rather than actually face to face. And that again changes how we have to explain the model to people at the other end. So what did we do? Well, for autoprognosis, we had you need your development and your external validation and we use the uk biobank it's a very large resource and we mix this with a us data set deliberately because this allows us to change the average risk levels by using a data that is completely different from ours both in time geography and in their risk level but the first thing when you're thinking clinically about this and how we're using ultra prognosis is how you think about managing your missing data and that's not just about having a uh, a table that shows you what, what these numbers are for each variable, it's thinking about the patterns and how they relate to the outcome of interest, so in our case, developing or dying from lung cancer. And what we noticed in the biobank was that there was this odd pattern where 22% of people were missing almost all of the key smoking variables. And this is completely changes how we do our imputation. And so it was really important. And it actually just turns out that these are former occasional smokers who were never asked how many cigarettes they smoked per day because they only smoked occasionally, perhaps on the weekend. Um, but this has been overlooked in some of the other papers that come in this direction. So it just shows you the importance of how you manage the missing data. 
But then thinking again more about how you deploy it, missing data in a clinical risk prediction context is important. And not all models tell you what you do about data that you don't have when you input the data, sorry, when you input a clinical risk prediction model and what the impact that will be on the results that you get. But then we really moved into autoprognosis and here's where the value of modeling came out. And so this is kind of the question of, does machine learning really need to be used in this particular context? Um, and the way that we were considering it is that there are three main steps to developing a risk model. The first after imputation being variable pre-processing, that's things like log transformations, normal transformations, whatever you might need. And then you have to select and train your algorithms followed by calibrating your model. And in most lung cancer models, they use either logistic regression or COX models. And indeed, there's a really good example in lung cancer of how two different teams built two models six years apart, one with logistic regression, the other COPS model on the same exact data set with nearly the same variables. And that time involved was quite substantial, but actually the COPS model ends up being ever so slightly better than the logistic regression. But because the logistic regression model came first, we always use that. Now, thinking about all of these models, this seems relatively straightforward, but actually the minute that you move into this level of complexity, you have a lot of different things to consider. So if you can see the code that I've just put up, so this is the kind of thing that you might be looking at if you want to optimize an XGBoost model. So that's thinking about all of these different hyperparameters, knowing what the right distributions are from which you have to subsample. And then you've got to do this for all of the different machine learning approaches. This could be like GBM, CatBoost, neural networks, the list goes on and on and on. And to have that level of expertise is, is quite unusual. And this was where one of the real advantages of autoprognosis appears, that you can use this kind of technique to shortcut some of this. And this is, for example, all of the algorithms available on autoprognosis too. But if we consider them, that's several thousand different combinations that no expert or not an expert can possibly use on their own. So with autoprognosis, not only is it democratizing access to some of these algorithms, but it is meaning that we can try all of them the first time, Avo avoiding that problem that I mentioned with lung cancer, where somebody tried logistic regression and a few years later they tried a Cox proportional hazard model. Instead, we should be really trying everything so that we get the best model the first time. As I said, it matters because there's a lot of resources that's required to actually get this into deployment, which means that we tend, to, once we have a model in clinical practice, to just use it. It's very difficult to improve on them. Now, the kind of next thing is thinking about value of information. In our case, we ran lots of trials. We knew kind of what predictors we were interested in. But then when we started to put the models together, we thought we saw that there was really almost all of the predictions were being driven by these three variables. So rather than use a big model, we decided to split this up and run a much smaller one. And this was probably the main advantage of something like autoprognosis. And I only could define this, but by looking at the value information and then combining it with these machine learning ensembles, we could consider whether three, three variables might be as good as something bigger. So then when thinking clinically about this, so why is somebody gonna use our model? And here we come to how for any of these models in the clinical setting, we have to validate them and benchmark them against all the comparators overall, but also in key subgroups. And so this can be discrimination, calibration, RIA scores, clinical utility, all of these will be necessary to show why we should be using a particular model. And in our case, we found that three variables, those three age, and two smoking variables were equivalent to more than 10 variables within a machine learning ensemble. And this is the kind of thing that autoprognosis produces at the other end, that this is what our actual model ended up being. So series of pre-processing steps followed by four different algorithms, all weighted ever so slightly differently, and it produces a single prediction. So although it looks complex from a patient perspective, it's not complex at all, it doesn't change how we actually deliver the uh, predictions. But before we can use it, with any automated machine learning, or in fact, any machine learning, the important thing is we have to be able to understand what we've done. And here, again, you can use uh, autoprognosis to be able to directly use SHAP as well as other um, algorithms for explainability. And in our case, this was useful. It allowed us to show that our model was picking up something that we already know from the literature, which is that there are key inflection points in the time of which people smoking before your list of lung cancer starts to really grow. And we saw this here. 
And then I suppose the next point is where or how are they going to use that model? And in our case, we will deploy this through the websites. We'll also make the models available through GitHub such that they can be downloaded and easily validated. But this is a key point because once you've developed your model and published your paper, if you're really going to make a clinical benefit from it, it, it doesn't really stop at this point. You, you need to have some way of integrating it with an electronic health record or thinking about a website. Most models at the moment use Excel spreadsheets, um, which have all kinds of problems attached. And then you have to think about whether it's going to be a UKCA or CE marked, and then who's going to maintain this? Because often models are built within an, a, um, uh, an academic setting, and that often means that the team will move on. But more than that, particularly in the domain that I come from in public health, you have to really showcase your benefits. So what is the benefit and harm of, and cost effectiveness of using your model versus whatever was done beforehand? And finally, we need to have methods of ongoing monitoring because models degrade their software, not aspirin. And as a result, they change as the average risk of the population changes. And this is something that we should be considering. But I hope that this has shown a little bit of how you can actually do quite a lot with autoprognosis. We managed to achieve something that hasn't been done before in terms of getting models that take usually 12 variables down to three. And that is potentially going to change how we are able to deliver lung cancer screening within a UK context and can be applied to many different areas. And I haven't touched on all the coding of how you can do this, but all of that's available on the GitHub webpage. And I'm sure Mahela will talk a bit more about that afterwards. Thank you very much, Tom for providing such a clear clinical context. What I decided to do today, because we have two guests that are cardiologists, Sara and Anthony, I thought about going back to the beginning of autoprognosis and telling you a little bit about how we can use autoprognosis for cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to go a little bit further into estimating the modeling and information gains with autoprognosis. Um, what Tom has talked already about, but going a little bit further into the details on how we did that for cardiovascular disease. As a reminder, um, we developed autoprognosis with the idea that it can be used to build numerous risk scores at scale to provide really a holistic patient view. So hopefully the uptake of autoprognosis uh, will be high and one, <clears throat> excuse me, can use autoprognosis for a variety of diseases and purposes, inclusively uh, not only for predicting disease, incidence of disease, but also um, it could be used like we did with NHS Digital during COVID for predicting resources in the clinical setting. An important though um, issue when using, using autoprognosis is assessing the number of variables and understanding which variables are needed to predict the presence of a particular disease. Tom has talked about um, lung cancer, but this is true for other diseases, inclusive cardiovascular disease. And what is important to note in this context is that both the number as well as the type of variables that are used may be changing for different classes of patients. For instance, patients that may have a particular comorbidity and also may be changing over time. I'll briefly touch upon this today. And I'm going to do that by having a focus on cardiovascular disease where the well-known uh, risk score over the years has been the Framingham score. Um, Tom talked about Q-risk. I'm not going to touch much on Q-risk, which is an algorithm in the United Kingdom for calculating a person's risk of developing a heart um, attack or stroke within a certain amount of time. But this is an alternative risk score that one could compare autoprognosis with. So how to build a new CVD score? One could take, for instance, a resource such as UK Biobank, which Tom has used for a lung cancer. This is what we used a few years back for building a CVD score. And at the time we looked at uh, predicting a variety of fatal and non-fatal CVD events within X years, X was five in our case, but you can set up the time from the baseline. And as you know, the UK Biobank 
contains a variety of sources of information. So the two main questions we asked a few years back were, can machine learning improve CVD risk prediction and can we discover new CVD risk scores either for the general population or for subclasses of patients? And for that, we used a precursor of the current autoprognosis tool, um, which we then applied to the UK Biobank. So um, the population uh, inclusion criteria were all the patients 40 years of age or older with no history of heart disease at baseline. And that led to a quite large number of patients being included in our study. Not all of them were used for training the model, only a subset was and the rest was used for testing. Um, and we had a total of 473 three variables or risk factors which could be included. But this is where the journey starts because as Tom is saying, there are two types of um, endeavors we can pursue. One is given all these different risk factors, trying to identify whether uh, new biomarkers and new risk factors can be identified on top of the well-known ones. But then conversely, what is the minimum number of risk factors we may need to include in a risk prediction model to um, issue recommendations, for instance, of um, treatments? So, um, as I mentioned, um, our clinical collaborators have identified a set of ICD-10 codes, inclusively um, coronary and ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and um, a few others. And this is what we used as the outcome of interest within five years from baseline. Again, autoprognosis would allow us to select any type of baseline and also do time to event analysis as well. The first part of the journey was trying to understand the modeling gain. So understanding, for instance, what would be the performance improvement of autoprognosis if we include all the clinical variables as opposed to a Cox proportional hazard model. This can be done both with all the variables as well as subsets of variables. And it is this particular gain that we feel should be reported in both clinical papers as well as when debugging and selecting models to use. Because given the number of variables selected, uh, one would like to understand what is the value of different types of models? Um, and as we discussed last time, this could be done either for autoprognosis as a whole or for the individual uh, machine learning models as well. Then the second part is about information gain. And here we took autoprognosis and we looked what would be the performance gain if we are including not all the variables available in the biobank, but only the seven risk factors included in the current Framingham score. Um, and even more interestingly, I think that autoprognosis can be used in the way in which Tom was mentioning to do investigation to understand how many variables do we really need to include in a particular risk score, either for the general population or a subpopulation because one can set the desired clinical accuracy. So what is particular um, level of accuracy that we need to attain for adoption in clinical practice? And this can be done with a variety of accuracy metrics in um, the autoprognosis package, not only area under receive and operating curve, one could define other metrics of performance and use them. And then identify what are the risk factors that one would need to, um, what is the minimum number of risk factors one would need to select to achieve and attain this desired clinical accuracy. So in other words is what is the minimum number of factors one would need to measure at this level of accuracy. Um, in the um, analysis that we did uh, four years back, we were able to show uh, this analysis for Framingham score, Cox proportional hazard model, both with the uh, seven core variables of Framingham, as well as with all the variables. And what you see here is the performance improvement. And at the population level, 
autoprognosis at that time, so the precursor of the current version, identified 8% more patients uh, from the training set that um, benefited, excuse me, from the testing set that benefited from receiving a preventative treatment. So an improvement, but a relatively modest improvement. What was more interesting was what followed. First, um, we identified the biomarkers from the UK Biobank, which led to an improved in area under receiver operating curve. And notable risk factors were walking pace and self-reported overall health rating, which are very easy to ask a patient even prior to coming to the clinic. So what was interesting to identify is, so, so what I'm trying to advocate here is not only to stop and use the well-known variables and assess the performance of that, but also use tools such as autoprognosis to identify new risk factors, potentially some that are very low cost and easy to um, get from a particular patient without much complexity. Um, and what's interesting to see is that none of these variables was considered by current risk scores. What's also interesting is that we didn't do this analysis only at the population level. We knew that cardiovascular disease scores, such as the Framingham score, underperform for diabetes. And what I'd like to highlight to you here is how you can take autoprognosis at the subpopulation level and ask additional questions. For instance, what you see here is the difference between the Framingham score and autoprognosis for patients that do not have diabetes. And you can see that the performance improvement is moderate, but for patients with diabetes, there is a huge performance improvement given the seven variables if we use autoprognosis. And the reason behind that is really the nonlinearity is present in the patient with diabetes. In addition, there were a large number of different variables which were useful to consider for diabetic patients. So what we learned is that we may not only want to do this investigation and look at performance improvement of machine learning models such as autoprognosis, as opposed to clinical risk scores at the population level, we may even want to do that in subpopulations of interest. And an example here is of the variables that were identified for diabetic patients as being, being risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So I'm not a cardiologist, but I want to just highlight to you here some of the way in which we can do the analysis. So what is the value of autoprognosis to summarize? You can build risk scores for a variety of diseases and populations. You can assess the number of variables and which variables are needed to predict the presence of a specific disease and look at different classes of patients, as well as the evolution of disease over the duration of um, its progression. So here we talk about cross-sectional data, but one could consider um, patients that have already been identified as cardiovascular patients, how does the risk changes over the duration of um, their lifetime given medication? So this can be used in using autoprognosis. We can also look at individualized feature importance. So going beyond just population-based feature importance, the interpretability methods that accompany autoprognosis 2.0 allow to identify what unique features were predictive for this particular patient. Can also be used for explainability. And that's something we plan to discuss in our next revolutionizing healthcare. How can one use the explainability packages associated with autoprognosis to interrogate these models and understand better disease. And finally, again, the fact that unlike many of the current clinical scores, this is an open source package. Um, and to highlight the fact that one could use this for understanding individualized feature importance, you see here the mortality risk, not for cardiovascular disease, but for a patient with breast cancer, and what you can see is that one can take autoprognosis, look at the particular patient, and identify what features were important for the prediction of this patient, 
and how do they change over time. This can be done using the autoprognosis package. Thank you very much. What, what I wanted to just stress, first of all, is that it's fortunate, I think, for medicine that there are an increasing a proliferation of guidelines to help us apply ML methods and, and NAI methods in medicine. And this is partly due to the development of multiple different uh, software as, as medical device applications. Uh, those are proliferating rapidly. And as a consequence, the guidelines that help us place those tools into the clinical context are also increasing rapidly. There are a large number of guidelines that are now agreed upon the way in which we should incorporate them into, into clinical studies. What we should be aiming for in terms of developing ML methods to help support clinical practice and decision making. But, and this is quite a big but, there are there is almost nothing about how we might go about achieving these aims. So we know what we're aiming for, but it's just not clear what way we can go about actually achieving those. And you can see from many of the uh, of the recommendations here from these are just the, one of the most recent sets uh, that the, the the key features that are being aimed for, whether that be transparency, whether that be comparison between models, uh, reflecting back against simpler models rather than uh, going straight for the more complex over engineered ML methods that may not be necessary. Um, many of these features are addressed by auto ML frameworks and perhaps arguably can only be addressed by an auto ML framework robustly. So in terms of trying to address how we can meet the guidelines that we're increasingly setting for ourselves, I think these frameworks are going to be necessary um, uh, to help us achieve that. The, the second point I wanted to stress was their, was their flexibility, because whilst there is a framework and a pipeline that can allow us to make lateral comparisons at every stage, so to optimize the hyperparameters, to optimize your missing data imputation stage, uh, your scaling, your processing, and also your, your method use for, for prediction, um, they're fundament, there's a fundamental requirement for them to be flexible, not just flexible in the sense that you can select or sub-select which methods are most appropriate for your question in hand, but not all tools may apply to all problems, so they have to be flexible. So whilst, whilst there needs to be a framework that's rigid enough to encompass any data set that might be put into it, it has to be flexible enough for the individual user. And I think that, for me, is, is a key feature of, of auto prognosis as well and needs to be. That also accommodates changing data sets and changing methods over time, because clearly what is available now is not necessarily going to be the optimal method in five years, 10 years time. This is a rapidly changing field and the ability to encompass new methods into that framework, which is I'm impressed is already happening. Um, that's going to be a fundamental requirement for this to be useful as well. The third thing I was going to stress is that it's almost like a little asterisk that we need to put on the end of, of the name that to a clinician, prognosis means a certain thing. It means that you are predicting the outcome of a condition once it has occurred. It's the natural history or the post-treatment history of that disease. And, and that isn't the only thing that, that autoprognosis can handle. It's clinical prediction of any sort, really, whether that be uh, treatment response, drug response, or whether that be di early diagnosis, as, as Tom's work has, has shown quite nicely. It can be applied in almost any clinical context or to any clinical problem, which is, which is again, part of the same flexibility. But perhaps one of the most important features is that I think it can interrupt the development of poor models very early on through debugging. And that's almost something that doesn't naturally come to mind when you think about a predictive tool or, or about prognostic uh, prognostication. And it's the feature importance piece that allows us to identify very early on which models are simply not telling us anything sensible, whether they're confounded by information leak, for example, where there are features in there that simply shouldn't be in there. And I've already seen examples since our last uh, RHC session where people have are now starting to use this and are finding out things they didn't realize about their data set because of its transparency and the ability to, to, to look at the feature importance. 
So I think that debugging step where it's quite common for us to come to a model and see that it's got great performance, but your first comment is, ah, yeah, but look at the features that are supporting this. They simply don't make clinical sense. The transparency and the ability to very easily look under the hood and find out what those features are should allow many poor models to be weeded out at a very early stage. So I think those are sort of three key things that I would want to stress here. The fact that this can facilitate us how to do something that we already know what it is we want to do, but also the flexibility to, to change over time and to incorporate different models. And also the fact that it's flexible in terms of its application in many different contexts. So I really just stress those things as a means of, of perhaps teeing up and, and moving straight into the, uh, the round table discussion session. So first, thank you so much, Sarah and Anthony, for joining us today. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you, as a clinician interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning, what excites you about tools such as autoprognosis? Um, you know, I think it's a great question, Mihaela. Um, I think in my mind, there are probably three things that excite me about auto autoprognosis. Uh, the first is its democratizing effect. Uh, it's certainly the case that right now, today, clinicians don't always have access to a data scientist to help them build models. And the fact that autoprognosis is such a powerful tool and accessible to people that aren't necessarily themselves data scientists, I think it really opens a lot of doors for its utilization going forward. Um, I think a second area that's really important uh, is um, its interpretability. Uh, as you can imagine, when clinicians are trying to make decisions, having tools that help them understand what is the logical basis for the decision that's being suggested um, is very important and is a key element in adoption. And then I think the third component is, you know, honestly, uh, its potential as being a general framework going forward. You know, I realize right now you've been focusing a lot on more um, categorical variables or continuous variables, but I could imagine this being a type of framework that starts being encapsulated in imaging data sets and all sorts of other tools of clinical decision support. To me, I look at autoprognosis 2.0 as being a very powerful step today, but I look forward to autoprognosis 10.0 when it's actually part of routine care. Thank you very much, Anthony. Sarah? Yeah, so I think it's really exciting uh, autoprognosis. And I think the thing that's so good is, like Anthony said, it's um, giving the power to the clinician to define their own problem, to bring their own data. And, you know, the clinicians are the ones who really understand how they can practically use the score um, to be most beneficial to the patients. And I mean, I think actually for the NHS, the fact that it's entirely free to use and open access is absolutely amazing. I mean, this is essential to allow researchers and clinicians to use it to design their own risk scores. And it completely bypasses the very lengthy procurement and legal processes that we'd normally have to go through to pay for any kind of more commercial product. So from that point of view, it's, it's a real game changer for us. Thank you very much, Sarah. So what can the, I know that both of you, uh, Anthony and Sarah are working with machine learning researchers. So I want to ask you, what do you think that we, the machine learning community can do to better interact with you, the clinicians and make an impact with the tools we are building in your world or empower you to make, a, to make alliance with you to make an impact on the clinical world? Yeah, um, I, I guess in thinking about the answer to this question, um, I actually think there's very little that the AI ML community could be doing better, um, but a lot that everything else could be doing better. And let me kind of particularly explain this. When I think about the barriers to adoption of modern machine learning in clinical decision support, um, it's almost never about the technical quality of the models or their interpretability or anything like that. But the three barriers that I see that really prevent its widespread utilization the first one is user experience. Um, just the act of a clinician having to open up a web page and type in, you know, do data entry even on a small number of variables. You know, you think about, let's say, the Framingham Heart Study that you just mentioned. Um, not that many cardiologists actually use it in clinic just because it's kind of annoying to open up the web page and have to enter the variables. And so getting to a place where a lot of this is done just much more automatically in the background, but that requires a lot of integration with the HR vendors, et cetera. So that's, that's one kind of real barrier. Um, the second one is the regulatory environment. Um, 
you know, when you think about how a lot of our diagnostics work today, they're very much nailed down. And so you get, you know, FDA approval for your diagnostic. Uh, and if you have to change it, then you have to re-get approval. Whereas clearly, you know, the opportunity is to build a learning healthcare system where you're always updating your models. I think everyone understands that this is where we need to go, but the actual task of making it that way and creating new regulatory environments, um, I think that's another challenge that needs to be solved. And the third is, you know, this is often sort of um, more specific to the US than to Europe or the UK, but is reimbursement. Um, you know, just like everyone else, uh, healthcare professionals follow economic incentives. And so things that either increase the amount that you can bill or that reduce the risk of lawsuits, um, that tends to often be what drives adoption. Uh, and so, you know, here again, just a lot has to change. And just to kind of close out this section, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that medicine throughout its history has embraced a number of profound new technologies, whether those be anesthesia, x-rays, antibiotics, sterile surgery, cath labs, uh, MRIs, CT scans, targeted chemotherapies, the list goes on and on. Each of these were transformative innovations that forever changed the course of medicine. In almost all of those examples, it was different than other fields of the world where technology tends to have a disruptive effect and the introduction of a new technology often goes with a change of existing authority structures. Um, none of these innovations I mentioned ever changed the medical institutions of the time. You know, when cath labs, cath labs were created, hospitals learned how to build them and learned to hire people that could do it. But the two things that have had a profound impact on the medical structures are changes in reimbursement and changes in regulation. You know, when healthcare reform happened in the US at the start of the Obama administration, it had a big change on how care was delivered. And a lot of hospitals really found themselves in a very different position than beforehand. So I guess I go back to what I said at the beginning, when I think about what's needed, um, I put very little of the emphasis on making the machine learning people do a better job and actually almost all of it on making everybody else do a better job. Sarah? Yeah, so um, I mean, again, you, you're doing all the right things, I think. And I think running webinars like this, so engaging clinicians and involving clinicians on your team and in your research teams so that they're actually involved in the process of developing the algorithms and developing the platforms. I think that that's really essential and has to be done more and more so that clinicians get more exposure and then have less of a fear of using these models in their clinical practice. I think um, initiatives like the Clinical AI Fellows in London, which is what I'm a part of, and this is the first year we've, we've done that, is actively educating clinicians in, um, in AI. And I think more initiatives like that is really what we need. Um, I think in terms of, like, we're all really familiar as clinicians with traditional statistics and we get taught it from, from medical school onwards. So I think actually we need to go back to the medical students and start teaching them um, the usefulness of these models and of um, machine learning and AI in general, and just have them have that familiarity with it so that they're not afraid of it when they're going into hospitals. It's not something that they see as, you know, unfamiliar and unknown and therefore potentially unsafe and actually just start breeding that familiarity with these new techniques so that, so that clinicians are just um, happier to use them really. Um, and I think um, the other thing is that part of what's fed into clinicians being less happy with AI is that historically there have been algorithms that have been deployed far too early and we have examples where suddenly we've had AI algorithms imposed upon us across many trusts and they and they don't work and clinicians have a really bad experience with them and then that puts them off for the ones going forward. So I think one really important thing is that we only deploy the algorithms that are well validated that clinicians have weighed in on and think are clinically useful and that way we can start building up the trust in the software and, and hopefully move forward with it. And this is the final question. <laughs> and actually, Anthony already alluded to it, so, so I don't know whether he wants to add anything. What would auto prognosis, not 10.0, but 3.0 look like? What capabilities do you believe should be a focus for us to add on 
these new versions of autoprognosis? You know, I, I definitely mentioned it before. I think, you know, extending it to imaging data, I think is a good one. I think there's um, another side, and this is maybe not autoprognosis 3.0, but maybe something a little bit further downstream. You know, people in the clinical trials world often talk about predictive and prognostic risk and kind of putting it in, in kind of putting it in the terms of a simple country cardiologist like myself, you know, the prognostic risk is you're predicting your risk of developing disease. Your predictive risk is, is better understanding the effect of a treatment and its impact. Um, you know, I think extending it to be not just auto prognosis, but auto predictiveness. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but um, that could be a very powerful side, knowing that the evidence base for the predictive effects is much harder to come by because it's counterfactual. Um, sorry to jump in uh, on this one, Anthony. I think that imaging in theory could be already used a little bit more pain, but it can be used as part of autoprognosis by allowing imaging features to be added as features of the autoprognosis score, but that will not be as easy to use. So you are right, this would be autoprognosis 2.5. Sarah. Yeah, actually, this was one of my questions to you anyway, Mihaila, was that actually, as Tom said in his presentation, we need to be monitoring these algorithms continuously once they're deployed. So do you see a way that um, autoprognosis or a similar software could automate that process so that clinicians aren't having to monitor and audit the software themselves once it's deployed? So thank you, Sarah, for this point. Definitely, I think that um, this is technology in the machine learning community exists to do so. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a method that's called lifelong learning for Bayesian optimization, which is the tool that selects these models. That's not part of the current autoprognosis, but can be built on top of it to indeed monitor the patients that are incoming and are used for this particular, this I think would be useful, um, not only for keep monitoring this, this score, but also for assessing whether this particular score is especially useful or it can be extended for a particular hospital or a particular ecosystem, because it could be that your hospital sees different types of patients than that of Anthony or Tom, and one could monitor that, could monitor the types of patients are coming and propose subsequent, let's say, um, improvements for the local hospital. So your question inspires me to, to, to think about subsequent versions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for, for this interesting roundtable discussion. And we go straight into the Q&A with the audience and already have a few questions um, there. The first one uh, from Timming Liu, um, who is asking on imputation and says, sometimes missing information is also informative. How should we deal with that? So it's, it's a great point, and it touches on the idea that, that missing this can be random. It can be non-random and, of course, uh, or completely at random. Um, Consequently, information can be baked into the patterns of missingness. And yes, patterns of missingness, if they are informative, and as long as they are generalizable, uh, I think it would be entirely reasonable for those patterns of missingness to still be providing and supporting the prediction in a model. Um, however, uh, you'd want to be particularly careful about that because most contexts of missingness, even where they're missing not at random, uh, that can vary substantially from one cohort to the next. So I personally would be particularly wary, and I think there would be low clinical acceptance of a model that was based upon patterns of missingness. But maybe related to this question, one could look at what Tom presented. So if certain information may not be valuable, so the reason it's not there is because it's not valuable for this subset of patients, maybe models could take that into consideration and make sure that the pertinent information is requested for the class of patients considered, for instance, diabetics versus not, women versus men, mm. maybe. Thank you very much. And the second question from Simona, um, can autoprognosis 2.0 also perform unsupervised classification? Is that something you can do? 
So thank you for this question. Um, so I would say it can provide more supervised classification if you like. So given the fact that we have an outcome of interest, for instance, cardiovascular disease, we can look at classes of patients and classes of features that were especially important for this particular diagnosis. So for instance, people who may walk faster may be at lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So one could use this post hoc interpretability methods to cluster patients and do what we call outcome-driven clustering or outcome-driven phenotyping. So um, I would say not unsupervised clustering. For unsupervised clustering, you don't need a supervised learning model such as autoprognosis, but what you can do is go to the next level, I would say, uh, not only to look at phenotypes like we think about today, which are based just on the features of the, of the covariates of the patients, but rather look at what are the different clusters of patients that may experience disease or may experience a particular type of disease. So I would say supervised clustering, yes, and that can be easily done as a post hoc step. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Johanna, who's asking uh, whether it's already planned to integrate autoprognosis in a prospective clinical trial. I think that's a great question because as uh, as Anthony was, was sort of highlighting, um, autoprognosis can build the predictive models, but I think for those to be incorporated directly into practice, there's still an onus on whoever has built the model to demonstrate its clinical value. So we may be able to predict better than the existing gold standard that's in place. What is the value of that increased prediction? What is the clinical impact of that increased prediction? Um, and in order for models to be completely accepted and translated, often it's necessary to demonstrate to the clinicians what the extra clinical value is of that information that's being provided. We've been in this situation before where we're trying to push something through with regulators. And unless you can demonstrate what the actual clinical outcome improvement is by in improving clinical prediction, uh, then you struggle to get full adoption. But unquestionably, to get to the point where you can improve prediction, autoprognosis will help. So it should help put better predictive models into clinical trials. But I don't think it obviates the need for clinical trials afterwards. And maybe to, to clarify, um, I think that autoprognosis is more a tool to build risk scores, it is up to the clinical community to maybe use it to ask interesting questions. And then if one of these questions leads to a better score that or better um, recommendation for a treatment, then one could use that subsequently and take it to clinical trials. So we feel that this tool is more empowerment rather than all the way going to, to real data and clinical scores. I don't know, Tom, if you want to add anything. No, I mean, I completely agree. I think the, the, the challenge is always the onus is going to be on whoever has built the model to then translate it into some version. And I think taking that a little bit further and sort of linking on to, um, to what uh, Anthony said earlier, um, uh, more fundamentally, one of the things as a, as a kind of framework this can help with, but I, I think that the clinical community is going to have to start thinking about risk prediction scores in a slightly different way. Um, in some respects, the current way that we do it is a bit of a cottage industry. Uh, certain teams develop a score and then maybe they improve it over time, but basically no one else ever kind of comes in. And that may well be that there's not much benefit to using that additional score, but sometimes there probably is. And the one of the troubles that we have is that kind of alluding to, uh, if you're going to have to, click on 15 different websites and you've got to find out where all of these different scores are, this is all going to be quite tough. And I wonder in the future whether we're going to have to think about how we use Regulus perhaps or some other method to centralize the interfaces with which you use these scores, but that behind the scenes, the scores are being modeled, evaluated, that can be continuous prospective trials. However, it happens such that from a clinical perspective, the overload is much less, but actually you're leaving the methodologists and statisticians to be able to use the best possible scores behind the scenes. And I think that that might be an important aspect to this um, in the future. I, I completely agree that clinicians don't 
punch the numbers in, even if it's a small number of variables in a model, they simply won't take the time to do that. But there are good examples in place where algorithms have already impacted where there's autom automated generation of a result, uh, perhaps EGFR in the context of nephrology, where instead of using a single lab value, you get a more accurate value if it's processed and put into a particular context. There's no reason why risk scores couldn't be incorporated and reported as part of, la of our laboratory management system, rather than individual results, for example, which would take away the need for clinicians to actually generate the score. They probably have to be accepted before that would be uh, undertaken. Thank you very much. Um, if you're interested in improving clean liquor trials in general, you can also go to our website where we have just put a new piece up, um, but it's also based on a revolutionizing healthcare session we had in the past. Um, let's go to the last question of today by Jean-Baptiste, who uh, is asking, do you have to make selection by testing features one by one, as in your nice example for the uh, cardiovascular disease, or is it automatically integrated in autoprognosis 2.0? Um, thank you, Jean-Baptiste, for this question. You can do either. You could either uh, do it one by one, or you can use tools such as Invase, which allow you post hoc to understand variable, variable importance, or you can use one of the many tools that we have for interpretability, like Sharp or Simplex, that will be able to, to understand will enable you to understand variable importance and potentially even variable importance for subclasses of patients. But this is something that as a user, you would need post hoc to engage with these methods and be able to, to, to do this type of analysis and this type of understanding. And this is border interpretability. So what we actually decided is that the next section of revolutionizing healthcare should be on interpretability and understanding these risk factors, which we feel it's an important companion to autoprognosis. So we hope that all of you who are here today will join us again next time. Okay. Thank you very much for all your questions. And thank you very much uh, also to our panelists and speakers of today. Uh, I think it was a very interesting second session on autoprognosis. Um, we were currently planning our next session and we will inform everyone on our mailing list uh, in the time about what's coming up next. Uh, this session will be on YouTube over the next few days so you can rewatch it and share it with your colleagues and friends uh, in a wider circle. And if you have more friends who are also practicing clinicians and might be interested in these sessions, please go to our website and um, sign up or send them there for themselves to sign up. And if you want to dive deeper, uh, dive deeper into autoprognosis, please go to autoprognosis.vandeshaar.com so where you can find all the interesting uh, introductions about the tool. You can find the tool itself, how to access it, and a very um, comprehensive demonstrator as well that leads you step by step to how to use it, try it out and be creative with it. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a good day and we will see you at the next session. Thank you.